Good morning, everybody. It's good to see John is back without broken bones or, uh, or damages. You've got to be careful with the skiing, John, at your age. John chapter 12. I'm going to miss Dory sitting there, you know. <laughs> yep, but he's with the Lord. It was good to have his occasional commentary. <laughs> Pastor Honey Church described him as a colourful character in the funeral, and I thought that was a good description. Uh, it's good to know that. Our eternal destiny doesn't rest on who we are or what we do, but on on Christ. Um, <clears throat> John chapter twelve is kind of a culmination of of <laughs> the first eleven chapters, hey? <laughs> but it's, it it does bring uh, the end of a section of the book because from thirteen uh, to seventeen it's Jesus really with his disciples. And then, of course, there's the cross and the resurrection. But we've gone through 11 chapters uh, of encounters of Jesus, uh, seeing uh, his life unfold before the eyes of, of um, his disciples and the people and the leaders and everybody else. And there have been many reactions to that, many responses. And, and this chapter kind of brings together, if you like, a number of different responses to Jesus. And then Jesus' response to the responses <laughs> and his final invitation, if you like. Um, it's a hymn writer of the last millennium, I can say, <laughs> which it covers many hymn writers, uh, who, who wrote um, this question in his hymn he said what will you do with Jesus neutral you cannot be someday your heart will be asking what will he do with me and this chapter is a little bit of a commentary of that it's a it's a it's a picture of what a number of people or groups of people were doing with Jesus it follows the resurrection of Lazarus, which was perhaps his greatest miracle sign other than the resurrection, the cross and the resurrection, of course, of, of the Saviour. But in terms of the signs that he was performing there, which were a testimony that he is, he was the Christ, the Son of God, so that we might believe in have life in his name, um, that, that raising of Lazarus was like a culmination. It was also a culmination in the intensity and the tension that was building up in Jerusalem. And so there are about six different reactions to Jesus in this. We're going to cover, uh, uh, well, we'll see what we cover. <laughs> We're going to cover... Uh, the six to some degree, but we'll focus on some particularly. So um, if we go to uh, the first verse of chapter 12, and we had it read to us, and this is the first response, if you like, that it records uh, um, in this group of six, if you like, uh, to Jesus, and in particular to what had occurred with the raising of Lazarus. Uh, and we see um, it's just a beautiful story, uh, a beautiful picture of a woman who is devoted to Christ. I was trained as an engineer. I like to do things. It's always about some end or getting somewhere and doing something and yet it almost seems like God doesn't always need us to be doing something Mary wasn't doing anything here 
well, she was acting, but, but she wasn't performing some great work in, 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 in the world's eyes. She wasn't producing anything, if you would like. And yet it's the first in the list, and I think it's the greatest, because it's a response of love. We sang about it in that last hymn, I love you, Lord. <laughs> it was a response of love, and it was... From a world's perspective, it was a foolish thing to do, wasn't it? <laughs> Judas picked up on that. It seemed like a foolish thing to do to waste a year's wages. I mean, Jesus knew that he loved her. Why did she have to go to the trouble of a year's wages in this, in this perfume, in this ointment, and, and pouring it out on his feet? But she couldn't help herself. See, nobody commanded her. Nobody had said to her, look, Mary, you owe it to Jesus. You need to show something about your love. Nobody had to do that. It would have been a hard press to keep her from doing it, you see. And so this is what we read. Six days before the Passover, so this is nigh to the Passover on the cross, Jesus came to Bethany, and I, I suppose it was a little bit of a, you could call it a celebration, <laughs> that was celebrating the life of Lazarus, except not like we do at a funeral. <laughs> they could have been ce celebrating the life of Lazarus at a funeral, as we would do, but he was alive, because Jesus is life. And he had brought him out of the grave, and it says, this Lazarus whom Jesus raised from the dead, they were having this dinner. And Martha, we will see in her usual fashion, was serving, which was not a bad thing. It wasn't a bad thing. And Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table, and, and so they would have been having a conversation. Uh, they would have been... Well, imagine sitting in on that conversation, hey? <laughs> conversing with Jesus. And so Mary comes in and she takes this pound of expensive ointment, I don't know, a little bit less than half a kilo, I think it was. Um, and it's described as spike nard, a pure nard. I've never seen it, but clearly it's something that is um, expensive. You kind of wonder how it could be a year's wages, but if you ever go to those perfumeries down there in, in Westfield, <laughs> you see the prices, you think, yeah, <laughs> maybe it could be a year's wages. So um, they take this pound of expensive ointment and she anoints the feet of Jesus and then she wipes it with her hair. It's a demeaning thing almost, isn't it? I mean, who would do this? And she didn't care. She didn't care how you classified this. She didn't care what people thought about it. It's a challenge to us, isn't it? Her, her love was so intense. And her thankfulness. She had her brother back. He could have still been in the t tomb, <laughs> decomposing. He had her brother back. And so, out of gratitude, um, she shows this devotion to Jesus. This worship, that's what it is. Thanksgiving. All those things that, that should be part and parcel of our Christian walk are often missing. <laughs> in everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I can give thanks in some things, but I'm not always thankful. But isn't it wonderful to be so, um, so entranced and captivated by Jesus that she didn't have to force her thankfulness and she didn't have to force her devotion. She didn't have to do this out of duty <laughs> other than the natural overflow of a loving heart that had seen Jesus. What would you do with Jesus? <laughs> and what did Mary do? She, she loved him 
and she expressed that love in, in a way that she thought was appropriate. And it was. The house was filled with perfume, it says, and, of course, the practical man, the, the practical man, the deceiver, as, as it turns out, Judas Iscariot, uh, looks at this and says, you know, how, how stupid is this to do this? Why would you do this? Remember, 300 denarii, that's about a year's salary, okay? It's not a small amount. Would you take one year's wages, <laughs> buy this perfume, and then just pour it out? How much am I willing to give for Jesus? And so she did this, and Judas says it's a waste should have been given to the poor. And there's a little commentary there. He didn't really care about the poor. See, this is a contrast between a woman's response and, a, and, and this man's response, Judas' response. Outwardly, by the way, they were both probably disciples of Jesus. Quite likely, Judas was perceived and seen as, as well, he was one of the disciples. Nobody knew what was going on in his heart other than Jesus. He was pilfering from the, the, the money bag. But apparently the other disciples weren't conscious of that. Jesus knew. But outwardly you would have said, he, he's, here is a follower of the Lord. And, and Mary was a, a follower of the Lord. And yet how different the hearts were. And God doesn't look at the outward appearance, it says. He doesn't care about how you're sitting here in church at the moment or, or how you conduct yourself outwardly when people are looking. He looks at the heart and he saw two very different hearts. He saw a heart of a man who was so filled with himself and didn't love Jesus at all. And that became evident shortly afterwards, didn't it? where he was prepared to betray the Son of God for 30 pieces of silver. And Jesus rebukes him, leave her alone. You leave her alone, singular you. He's actually rebuking Judas directly. You leave her alone. So that she may keep it for the day of my burial. Whether that means that she was, she actually had this uh, prepared for the day that he would die, uh, as an embalming um, ointment. In in Matthew, and I think it's I think it's in Mark, uh, this same passage tells us really that this was like uh, a symbolic of his actual burial. His, his death was coming. No longer would he be saying, my time has not yet come. Because his time had now come. It was at the door. And so, in this wonderful act of love, which is recorded here for eternity, <laughs> there are many people that have done great things for God, so to speak, that, that are not on the record anywhere. And this woman who did this act of just, just devotion to God, he saw fit to prepare it, to, 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 to put it down here, and not only to put it down here as a, as a testimony, if you like, of the love of this woman, but also as a symbol of his up-and-coming death and burial. Wonderful thing. It's not the first time she's done this, by the way. Well, a little bit different. In Luke chapter 10, it says when Jesus uh, was um, in the house of Mary and Martha. You probably know that story, don't you? Um, Martha had welcomed him into her house and she had a sister called Mary and they sat at the Lord's feet listening to his teaching. There may have been others there. I think presumably this was in that same home. 
Uh, and it says Martha was distracted with much serving. She was the doer. <laughs> and she went up to him and said, this was in Luke chapter 10, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. I get that instruction sometimes. Help me do the dishes. <laughs> I can't use this as an excuse not to do them, though. But, you know, she's busy. It's not a bad thing to be doing things. We need people to do things. But, you see, it's, it's all about the heart. Ma- Martha was doing things, but she wasn't really doing them with a willing heart. She was doing them, and she kept her eye on Mary, thinking, you know, when's she going to do her bit? Now, she was not like Judas, but there's, a, there's a, a, a kind of a parallel, isn't there? Judas has got his own criticism of Mary's devotion, and, and here Martha's critical of Mary's devotion because she's wasting her time listening to Jesus. Wow. <laughs> Do you waste your time listening to Jesus? She wasted her time listening to Jesus. Well, so it seemed. And Martha, uh, 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 and, she, and she says to the Lord, you, you tell her to come and help me. And the Lord's answer was, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. The Lord for whatever reason, loves our devotion to him. He loves our love. We are, we're called primarily to love the Lord, our God, with all our heart, all our soul, and all our might. That's the the great commandment. Do you know, whenever we express our love in a genuine sense to God, he, he loves that. It blesses his heart. It happened another time in, in Luke chapter 7 with um, the sinful wom- woman at Simon's house, you'll recall. And uh, um, you'll remember that uh, the people were, were complaining. They were saying, if this man were a prophet, Jesus... In Luke 7, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And, and so they were there at his house, at Simon's house, and, and you know the story, she had actually came and uh, into that at the table in that man's house, who was a Pharisee, who was a, he was a le- leading figure, and she actually brought an alabaster flask of ointment in this incident, the different incident, and she stood behind him at his feet and weeping. She began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. And so the response came, you know, if, if Jesus were a prophet, he would know what sort of woman this was. But Jesus, he's, he's not looking for people who have got their lives together. <laughs> this woman was an honest woman. Because anyone... He could have said this of anyone, this Pharisee. Anyone touching Jesus, you could have said of them, (laughs) if this man were a prophet, he would have known who or what sort of person this was, that he or she is a sinner. Couldn't he say that of every one of us? Now, of course, for, for Simon, who was an upstanding man, and this woman, who was is probably a prostitute, Well, you can't compare those two, you see. This woman was a sinner, but not this man. Lord, I'm so thankful. (laughs) I'm so thankful, God, that I am not like this. (laughs) 
publican over here. Because <laughs> I do all of these things. And I'm upstanding and I'm good. But this woman who was broken and who was weeping, <laughs> she opened this perfume and, and, and anointed Jesus' feet. And I think the Lord, and look, I've got not much basis for saying this, but I'll say it. <laughs> I think the Lord appreciated the tears, Bob. I think the tears were more valuable. And um, <clears throat> Jesus tells a story then of a money lender who has two debtors. One has a huge debt and is forgiven. One has a small debt and is forgiven. And he says to Simon, which one <laughs> loves him more? And Simon said, the one, I suppose, for whom he cancelled the larger debt. And Jesus said, you judge rightly. And then he turned toward the woman and he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears, wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, for she has anointed, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. How much have we been forgiven? How much have you been forgiven? It seems like the, um, the degree to which we understand and appreciate what God has done for us is the degree to which we respond in love. And we love much. This wasn't forced. Love by its very nature is not a forced thing. When God made Adam and Eve, he didn't he, he could have made them do whatever he wanted. <laughs> He's God. He could have stopped them eating the fruit. He could do what he would do. But, but anything that is coerced in that sense is not love. <laughs> You've heard of shotgun weddings, haven't you? You know, if someone marries someone at the point of a shotgun, that's not love. See, that's coercion. You can get the result. Outwardly, you can get the, the marriage. We can get the result. God could have had us do whatever he would, and yet what he desires... The scripture says, this is the great commandment. What he desires is for us to love him. And from that should flow what we do for Jesus. Now, yes, the Christian life involves a discipline. It involves uh, commitment and work and fight and labour. There's no question about that. And suffering can involve all of those things. But somewhere there has to be a motivation. See, that word motivation is the same word for which we have move. <laughs> there has to be something that moves us or someone who moves us. And that someone is God who is love. And when I respond and see what he's done for me, I can grow in love. And when I grow in love, nobody will have to force me to obey God. Just like nobody had to force Mary to do this. 
Nobody has to force me to give, whether it's my money or my time. That's why God loves a cheerful giver. That's why we're to give when we give of our wealth. We give um, not grudgingly of necessity because that's not love. Mary didn't pour the ointment grudgingly or of necessity. She was not thinking in her mind, 12 months of wages. I hope he realises what I'm doing. <laughs> you, can, you can see that, can't you, in the past? There's, no, there's not a trace of that. She's a devoted woman. Now, why is it so hard to be devoted to Jesus? Well, she saw something in him that we don't always see. She sat at his feet and listened to him. She enjoyed his presence. And out of that came this response, the first response, the great response. I think the response that matters more than any other. Now, I'm not going to go through the other responses this morning. I think it's probably better for us just to reflect on that. But I will ask myself, as well as you, what is my response? Because there were responses of, of, of adoration in the triumphal entry. Uh, when they shouted, Hosanna! <laughs> The Hosanna turned into crucify him only a week later. There were responses of uh, whether you would call it curiosity or interest. The Greeks, there were some Greeks there saying we would see Jesus. Whether they'd heard about, I'm sure they'd heard about the raising of Lazarus. They probably heard about some of the other things he did. We want to, we'd like to see him. There was that response. There was the response even of faith amongst the authorities of the Pharisees. You read that later on. The hidden believers. Because <laughs> they were scared. They were scared to stand up for Jesus because they, they might, would be ostracised. <laughs> they would be ostracised. But they, they did believe. There were those responses. And there was a response of unbelief. See, when I ask what would you do with Jesus, neutral you cannot be, that's so. (laughs) He's very polarising. Mary's response was devotion and love. There were others who believed him, who trusted him, and would have expressed that in many other ways. There were those that cried out, Hosanna, and and some of those might might have been um, um, hypocritical, but there, there were probably genuine people in that lot I don't think necessarily the very people that cried Hosanna were exactly the same people that cried crucify him but you know in the crowds there would have been a mixture of all of them but there were the response of those who had hardened their heart and we read in verse 37 though he had done so many signs before them they still did not believe him hey, a man was raised from the dead you still will not believe. In fulfilment of the prophecy, John writes, in Isaiah, Lord, who has believed what he heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. He's going back to this prophetic word. It's a dangerous place to reject him and to fight him. That's why that that hymn says, neutral you cannot be. Someday your heart will be asking, what will he do with me? These people who hardened their heart, these people whose eyes were blinded, brought it upon themselves. 
Can't blame God for that. That's why if, if the Lord's speaking to you about something, you have to seek the Lord while he may be found. Because he won't always be found. He doesn't have to reveal himself to any of us. So when I know in my heart that he's calling that's my time. That verse in Isaiah, in Isaiah 50, 55, it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. I think, and let him return to the Lord. Neutral you cannot be. And so there were these people, as well as the people that believed, as well as devoted Mary, there were those who would not, who would not, who would not. May it not be anybody in this place. What will you do with Jesus? He's done everything for you. And even while you were yet sinner, Christ died for us. That's the love of God. And we love him only because he first loved us. Mary loved him because she knew how much he loved her. That prostitute loved him because she knew he was someone who would and could be merciful to her. What will you do with Jesus? Neutral? You cannot be. Someday, your heart will be asking, what will he do with me? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, the devotion of this woman is a challenge to our hearts. and Forgive me, forgive us for um, the lack of devotion. And perhaps for the clinical manner in which sometimes we conduct our relationship with you, we do want to say we love you. I pray for anyone here who, who needs to express that love in some way that, that you would prompt them, prompt each of us in whichever way would be right and a blessing to you that we might express that love today and in the coming week and in our coming days on this earth we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.